Uh, I'm very excited to be here today, and um, especially the first speaker this morning. Uh, but the whole loop track, this is the second year I've done this, and uh, we have uh, a very full program this year, and everybody who's speaking is somebody who wasn't able to come last year, or uh, you know, there's no, there'd be no overlap. So I think that's indicative of the interest there is in, in the moon and in um, using space resources, and, and the moon is obviously the first and closest place for us to start doing that. So I'll be hearing a lot about that. Uh, we actually have such a full program, we have two speakers uh, who couldn't get in today, and, and we'll have them tomorrow. Greg Nevitz of Orbital Development will be talking at uh, 11 a.m. tomorrow in, uh, in this area, and uh, Martin Lowe of the Jet Propulsion Lab will be talking tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. So uh, I'll be mentioning that again later. But our first speaker this morning is uh, Dr. David Criswell, a physicist, um, director of the Institute of Space Systems Operations at the University of Houston, associate director of the Texas Space Grant Consortium, and he's worked on um, and with NASA on space issues such as industrial processing of lunar material, space transportation, robotics, and what we'll be hearing about today, um, lunar solar power. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Crystal. Thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to speak here, and I want to thank the organizing committee for giving me that chance. I think the moon is absolutely critical to the future of the human race in the immediate future, and is a, will uh, have an effect on the standard of living of ourselves and our children and our grandchildren. And it's probably the only solution to uh, providing adequate commercial power for global prosperity. This is, uh, I would encourage everybody to move down and move to the side so that I don't block your view. This is what I'm going to talk about over the next 50 minutes or 40 minutes. Uh, this is a plot from 1900 to uh, about 2000. It's by uh, Angus Madison, who was an economist at the, uh, in Paris at the OECD. And it's uh, over this century that plots on the vertical scale the, uh, essentially the income, the total national income per person of the world. And back in 1900, it was down below uh, $2,000 a person a year, average over the entire world. And then after World War II, it started growing and reached about $4,000 or $4,500 a person a year by the early 90s. It's probably increased a little bit. It looks like it's going to decrease on a per capita basis, or at least not going to grow rapidly uh, the next decade. Now, the world can be more or less divided into the rich and the poor. We're rich, whether you realize it or not, you're all rich in this room. And uh, that's the Western nations, people in the Western nations, Western Europe, U.S., Canada, Japan, Australia, some, uh, New Zealand, some, uh, some of the city-states, Singapore, etc. And if you plot their average income over that same time, it's much higher. It's growing, and after World War II, it grew very, very quickly, up to about uh, $15,000, $16,000. Now, the U.S. is extremely rich. We're up around $30,000. If you subtract out the income now of that one million people and look at the average income of the other five billion, the 5.6 billion people now, that's down below $3,000 a year. And what that means for me personally is that my electric bill at home, which is my residence bill, is more than the average income of the other five, 5.6 billion people in the world. And what we need to do is find a way to get enough power, commercial power, to these people that they can afford, which implies about a cent a kilowatt electric power, that they can bring into existence the machines and systems that let them generate wealth. And this has to be sustainable. So what I'm talking about is not a problem for the future. It's a problem right now that affects virtually every person in the world.
So for our prosperity, every person needs at least two kilowatts of electric power per person. And that has to be clean, it has to be affordable, and it has to be sustainable. And sustainable doesn't mean for a few advertising periods, it means century after century after century. We now supply the world the equivalent of about 4.7 terawatts of electric power. A terawatt is 10 to the 12 watts. If you measure this in thermal power, which is less efficient, it's about 14 terawatts thermal. Right now, we should be between two and a half and three times, providing two and a half, three times more power, about 12 terawatts electric right now. By 2050, when there will be about two billion, uh, 10 billion people, this needs to be up to around 20 terawatts electric, about four times more than we've got now. Uh, that would be equivalent to, if you were to burn oil and do this, 900 million barrels of oil a day, almost a billion barrels of oil a day. World oil production now is one tenth that, and we'll never, never come anywhere close to this. Uh, and the problem is that conventional fuel sources, like coal, like oil, and power systems like our electric generating systems using hydro, coal, oil, and natural gas, are non renewable. Are they too small? Are they polluting? Are they dependent on politically sensitive regions such as we've bought wars in the past uh, hundred years? And the power that comes out of it, as I showed in that, on that first graph, is too expensive for about 80% of the people in the world, and so 90% of the people in the world. So there's some very stiff requirements that you have to put on this global power system. It has to be brought into existence very quickly unless world strife and poverty just increase. You've got to be sustainable, that means hundreds of centuries. It has to be a source of energy, electricity, that, that does not produce physical contaminants or excessive stored energy in the biosphere. Excessive stored energy would be like the radionuclides from power plants. And that energy should be so clean that you can use it to remediate and nurture the biosphere, move past sustainability, and actually move toward making the world better without the physical contamination problem. And to bring along the developing nations, at least initially, you have to be able to provide this at about a cent a kilowatt electric hour. In Houston, which has fairly cheap electric rates, I pay about eight cents a kilowatt electric hour average over. And here's some other requirements. This power has to be widely accessible, uh, uh, dependable, independent of the natural flows of energy and mass through the biosphere, through the ocean, lakes, rivers, and even through the lithosphere of Earth. It has to be a system that has significant growth potential. People may want to have, may need to have more than two kilowatts electric. They may need to get up to five. So we might be looking at a close to a hundred terawatt world. And it's a system that intrinsically would be much more attractive if, if it could intrinsically uh, uh, provide protection from Earth from uh, significant changes in the radiative forcing which controls our climate. That's changes in the sun, and changes in the condition of the Earth that affect its overall albedo, and significant collisions with asteroids and comets. Now I'm going, not going to go through this stuff in detail, but I just want to give you a feel. I've looked through about 30 options for providing global power, and I've done the trick that physicists and engineers use all the time. I'm saying that the total energy that you have to supply in a century is about 2,000 terawatt years for global prosperity for 10 million people. That's 20 terawatts times 100 electric times 100 years. So I take the energy of a source like, say, coal, that you get out of the literature, you divide it by 2,000 terawatt years, and you say, okay, this ratio has to be significantly greater than one. But for coal, our largest characterized source of fossil fuels, it's only about 30%, 0.3. The other thing is, this is a power system. Once it gets the fuel in, it has to change it into useful power. So we need 20 terawatts. Let's take, again, coal. If you go into the literature and ask how aggressively could you grow, grow coal-fired systems by 2050 and you divide that by 20 terawatts, it would only be up to about 20% of what you need. And so as long as these numbers are less than one, it's not a very attractive system if you have to put a large part of your gross world product in the building. 
the biosphere is trivial. Uh, the only hydro, the only uh, hydrocarbon that may be big, bigger than one is natural gas hydrates, which have only been uh, only now starting to characterize. It looks very unlikely that you could afford to uh, mine them. They're a pretty dispersed resource. So that was living and fossil. Nuclear. Fission, again, you go into the literature, and it's hard to see that you'd get, first off, without breeding, you'd get more than 0.1 of the total energy you need, and 0.1, 10% of the power you need by 2050. With breeders using uh, terrestrial uh, continental resources, you might have six times more than you need for one century. But again, they're so expensive to build and operate, they couldn't provide the power you need. You would have to do things like mining uranium out of the Gulf Stream to get enough raw uranium, but again, you're power limited. Fission, uh, fusion, I'm sorry, and fission fusion are all require remarkable advances in technology to provide the power that you need. There's, there is no operating fusion reactor. There's a lot of attention to helium 3 but the primary resource is extremely uncharacterized. At the very maximum, you might be able to run 40 centuries, but if you can't efficiently remove the helium-3 from the moon, and it's not as much there as people project, this might be zero. And these estimates over in here come from studies by the, sponsored by the World Energy Council, which is the largest nonprofit energy organization in the world, as far as I know. Uh, geothermal. When I first realized this, it's sort of mind-boggling to me. Uh, the heat of the earth comes from the infall of the stuff that made the earth and then the nuclear reactions that are going on very slowly to make the decay of uranium and thorium in the earth. The total power output, though, is only 35 terawatts for the entire earth. When you put in the engineering inefficiencies, you could only, if you extracted all of the heat energy of the entire earth, you could only produce about 3% of the power we need by 2050. There's a lot down there in the form of latent heat in the crust, the first seven kilometers, but you've got to mine it. And a question, and you'd be reducing the average energy density of that upper seven kilometers by about 0.2% uh, a century. And you have absolutely no idea what the geologic consequences are. Plus, this has never been uh, demonstrated on a large scale. You could, and I think this was in the moon as a harsh mistress, put a mass driver on the moon and start throwing it down, pieces down, and let them impact and make an artificial volcano uh, that you tap the heat out of. But I don't think I'm going to let that happen in my biosphere, and I think most people would be against it. You have two million centuries, though, of energy before you use the poor moon all the way up. Uh, similar gains with near Earth asteroids. We're just not going to let stuff fall into the biosphere, even in a controlled manner. Solar on Earth takes many forms, hydroelectric. Unfortunately, it's down uh, maybe 8% of the needed power. And I'm not going to go into these. They're, uh, I've got papers that I can reference you to, and I brought a few copies with me. Ocean tides, waves, and all, again, they're just very, very minor contributors. When you look at 2,000 terawatt electric years per century, with 20 terawatts of power, electric power continuously. Whenever you see a statement that says, we've got plenty of coal and oil for the next several centuries, the flip side of that statement is, that's true only if most of the world stays dirt poor. So if you see an Arthur Daniels, middle of an ad that says we're going to solve it all with corn. That's BS. Solar on Earth uh, also takes the form of wind, terrestrial solar, and photovoltaics. Uh, wind is probably the only reasonable uh, on Earth resource to look at. Not, not the wind that is captured by windmills uh, set on the surface of the Earth. Uh, they would have to capture over 30% of all of the low-level winds that flow across all the continents on Earth to provide the adequate power. When you look at cost constraints, you're probably down at about 30% of what its power is required. 
uh, helicopter-like tethered windmills that capture uh, the more dependable wind at high altitudes, say about 20 or 30,000 feet, might be actually a reasonable option, but you're going to have these tethers all over the earth to provide you 20 terawatts electric. Uh, that was proposed by Australia about 20 years ago. Uh, the problem with uh, solar on earth is the clouds and the atmosphere and the massiveness of the installations that are required to gather this amount of power. You could occupy up to 20% uh, of the land area, the continental land area of Earth, to provide this level of power dependably, and the cost could very well exceed the total gross world output integrated over the time that it takes to build up and maintain that system. Mixed systems, that's what we've got now, combinations of coal, oil, natural gas, hydro. You say, well, let's just expand what we've got. These are not my numbers. They come out of these World Energy Congress uh, funded numbers. The most aggressive projection I've seen for building up conventional systems would uh, let you tap about 1,000 terawatt electric uh, years of energy over a century, but would not get you up to the power level. You'd only get up to about 12 terawatts electric. Now, a terawatt is a thousand gigawatts, so a million gigawatt electric years is, is the same as a thousand terawatt electric years. And this is a crude estimate of the total cost to build a system starting now that by 2040, 2050 would provide everybody with adequate power and then maintain it for 20 to 30 years, so a life cycle. Coal would cost on the order of a thousand trillion dollars. Now, this is such big numbers that don't even make sense to a lot of people in government. Uh, a way to think about it, though, is if you remember that the average world income is about $4,000 a year, or take that as a rough cut, and then add up the income for the next 50 years for everybody on Earth at $4,000 a year if you're building up these systems, and then another uh, 20 years of state-to-state -state production, the total interval of the world income would only be $2,400 trillion. And so in the case of vision, if the environmental costs, health and safety are as bad as some people think, that could actually exceed your world income. Terrestrial solar, where you have no long-term redistribution of power around the Earth, uh, would be on the order of 40% of this, or, or I'm sorry, on the, this is thermal, on the order of 40%. Here you'd be getting up with terrestrial photovoltaics, the order of 80%. Uh, and there is a, a PhD thesis by a gentleman in Germany who looked at this, a global uh, Buckmeister-Fuller type arrangement of photocells all over the deserts, of the major deserts of the earth and power lines connecting them. His cost projections are actually on the order of $10,000 trillion for a system like that. You can't build it. On the other hand, what I'm going to be talking to you about is the lunar system, which can have costs, life cycle costs down on this order, the order of uh, uh, a few trillion dollars. And that brings me to the last set then, solar power in space. The original idea goes back to Peter Glaser in the late six, mid to late 60s, the idea of putting building on Earth components of satellites that are then taken to geosynchronous orbit, assembled. They collect sunlight and beam it down to the Earth. Uh, in the 70s, there was about $25 million. Uh, today, it would be equivalent to about $70, $80 million in R&D. And the conclusion was that you could do these things technically. I have some doubts about that. Uh, but they would be far too expensive. The whole thing was revisited in the 90s, late 90s, it's called the NASA Fresh Look Study, and essentially they came to the same conclusions. But even with very aggressive technology development, you'd only get about 1% of the power that you need by, by 2050, and it would be very, very expensive. Now let's go back and look at the sun. Of course, the sun is the ultimate resource for energy and power in the solar system. It has about three times 10 to the 20th centuries of energy there. Uh, and about uh, almost 10 to the 13th times more power than you need. So the question is, how do you tap it? 
And at the orbit of Earth, it's a diffuse resource. You've got to find some very cheap, low-cost way to uh, gather that energy. And the key is the lunar solar power system, or really the key is the moon. The moon is illuminated with 13,000 terawatts of solar energy, about five to 700 times more than you need for a prosperous Earth. So this is the solution, at least in my estimation. Um, the sun is the power source that reliably eliminates the moon with about 13,000 terawatts of solar energy. You build bases on the two edges of the moon, so one or the other is sunlight, except around new moon, in which you put power, uh, power lines and photovoltaics just across the limb on the back side, and then you're always getting power with the exception of a full eclipse of the moon by the Earth, which we had last week or two weeks ago. In that case, you have to have at least three hours, you have to have three hours of power storage built in on the moon or on the Earth to accommodate that outage. The solar would be, uh, the bases would be built on the moon from lunar materials. They would take sunlight, change it to electricity, change it to low intensity beams of microwaves that would be focused to receivers on Earth called rectifying antennas or rectennas that even in the late 70s or mid-70s demonstrated out at uh, Goldstone that you could uh, convert 85% of this beam into output electricity on the surface of Earth. And this beam would come in at low intensity, less than 20% of noontime sunlight. You work at a frequency around uh, 10 centimeters, 12 centimeters that the atmosphere is transparent to. It goes very effectively through everything but the very heaviest of rain. So it would be reliable. You go through rain, clouds, dust, smoke, etc. The rectennas receive and convert beams to electricity and then put it out to the, to the region. So you can also cut down the uh, use of high, ten, uh, high tension, long distance power lines. Now, to put this on a less global scale, to bring it down to our level, a person that needs two kilowatts of electric power. That person would need, in effect, only 14 square meters of rectenna area. That would have a mass of about a boom, about a boom box, and that would provide you adequate power for a reasonable standard of living for the rest of your life. And that would replace over 500, in the case of the U.S., if you, if you triple these, on the order of 1,500 tons of coal burned over the year, which translates into about four, uh, three times more CO2 output. Still today, with the younger generation, and there's a lot of poo pooing of, well, you know, this is science fiction, but it's not. This is the big Arecibo uh, radio dish down in Puerto Rico, and everybody knows about it as a receiver of uh, signals for contact, extraterrestrials, and radio astronomy. But what most people don't realize is it also has a radar transmitter in it, now a megawatt transmitter. And it can be used to send the beam up. And this is a picture of the south pole of the moon, which would be almost completely dark in the visible light, taken by that beam. And it's done routinely. When this beam goes through the atmosphere, it goes through the atmosphere with about 10% of the power density required for power transmission. So it goes through with about 2% of the intensity of sunlight. And uh, moon to Earth power beam is actually going to be much easier than going from the Earth to the moon because there will be no, any atmospheric effects at all coming out from the moon. So power beaming is really a reasonable extension of existing uh, uh, radar technology, and in particular phase ray uh, technology. I'll show you a picture of one of those in a minute. Uh, assuming 80s, more or less 80s, operating technology uh, to provide 20, 000, uh, 20 terawatts to Earth would take pairs of bases on the moon that to your eye, in this case, are broken up into 10 bases, 10 on each side, that occupy to your eye about that much of the moon. These would be, in this example, each would be about 100 kilometers across. You're building on the curve of the moon, so these are actually 
elliptical shapes that are 100 kilometers in the north-south direction, about 600 kilometers east-west. And with auxiliary photovoltaics on the far side of the moon, just 400 to 500 kilometers on the far side, uh, you would have our power all the time coming back to Earth, either directly or through relay satellites. I'll mention that a little later. Uh, same face of the moon always faces the Earth. Uh, and this would be an example of a harvested moon. With technologies that you can see by 2020, many of which are already operating past the lab stage, these bases would reduce down in total coverage size to, to less than 0.2% of the lunar surface. Now, what are we doing on the moon? The basic unit on the moon is a power plot. It's cons it consists of solar cells that are in, in this particular model. There are many, many ways to do this, but in this particular model that I use for doing the engineering calculations, it would be like little puck tents. The cells would be like little puck tents arranged in the north-south direction when the, uh, and, uh, they'd be made out of lunar glass, thin lunar glass. Uh, uh, silicon deposited on the inside with uh, uh, hookup wires made out of maybe lunar iron. And uh, in the morning, the sun would rise and fully illuminate one side of these. You'd get good power output at noon and be split. In the evening, it would fully illuminate the sun and fully illuminate the other side. So you get a nice leveling out of the power output of these. And these might cover an area the size of this room. It's, it's really what you want to do. Uh, lunar iron extracted from the soil would then be buried under the soil and connect, collect all of this power and bring it to a microwave transmitter, which uh, essentially can be the technology that's inside of the microwave oven for generating power. And there would be control circuits where you could bring from Earth. That, and this is the simplest system that what you actually implement this will be visually more complicated. This would power, microwave power, would then illuminate this reflective screen, again, made out of lunar glass, uh, fiberglass stretched across here, coated with metal. And this screen then would radiate a little power back to Earth. Now, one of these by itself will do you no good at all. You've got to replicate this inside of one of those circles so that when viewed from Earth, you view this screen, this screen, this screen, like billboards on a curved highway. They all tend to look like they overlap in one huge stream. And once you get this to about uh, 30 kilometers across, you can you can start broadcasting. I'm sorry, I don't know how to control this one. You can start broadcasting very well-defined beams back to Earth. About uh, 60 to 70 percent of the power that hits these screens goes goes into a uh, beam that you can very carefully point back to the point on Earth with an accuracy of about one meter. So here's your basic unit. You replicate that. You build it out of the material on the moon. So what you bring up from Earth are machines of production that build this stuff, and that gives you leverage. When you go through a model of building solar power satellites out of lunar material and adapt that to doing it on the moon with the lunar material, not taking anything into space and not much, you immediately get a factor of 50 increase in the performance. And that translates immediately into lower cost. Now, phased array radars are not uh, fantasies either. This one's been in existence about 20 years down at Eglin. It's one of many different designs of phased arrays, which are solid state elements that are phased together. And this was used, or earlier versions of this were used to track uh, some of the astronauts' gloves in orbit around the Earth. This is not a radar, it's a radio receiver. It's the uh, very large array out in Socorro, New Mexico. It runs on railroad tracks. They've got, uh, I think, 28 or 30 of these parabolic dishes. And when it's fully extended, it's 30 kilometers across, and it operates at 10 times the phasing accuracy that you need for dependable transmission power back to Earth. Uh, that's been operating in an autonomous mode for about 20 years now. 
And there's nobody out of that. There's only maintenance people, three or four maintenance people out at the uh, control center. Everybody else is in support. And these things operate so dependently. And in 92, when I took a Cook's tour of this with a guy who was a PhD who was in charge of the timing and phasing accuracy of these arrays, he couldn't imagine what the problem was with the lunar system. These have to track continuously over the sky. The lunar, you just stand there and stare at the Earth. It stays right in front of you. Uh, I'll come back to this in a minute, but I need to mention it right now. Once you've got electricity in place and you've got infrastructure for building uh, glass, fabricating glass components, assembling microwave devices, uh, handling wire and iron and this sort of thing, you've then got the infrastructure in place if you were clever with your initial design to build most of these machines of uh, production and even habitats out of the local material. That gives you then another standard of leveraging for getting energy back. Now, a kilogram of solar power satellite would get about 10,000 kilowatt electric hours back to Earth. By just using the lunar materials on the moon, you immediately increase that. And the fact that the moon is much, much bigger than any satellite you can set, you can build, you can increase that uh, with then the secondary leveraging to where you're getting over almost 150 million kilowatt electric hours back for every kilogram you send to the moon. So you could actually afford to get this started with Apollo hardware. On the other hand, you can take shuttle system architecture, change it around and bring the cost down to where uh, it would be very, very manageable. Now I want to, uh, this next graph is going to discuss the power plots, the production equipment, and then the leveraging. These are the power, you, you get to the moon with production equipment, those mobile things like, uh, you know, think of them not as an Intel factory, but as a road building apparatus that moves across the countryside. That would be what you bring from Earth initially, is that mobile equipment. It starts building the power plots. And after you've gotten past the demo, full-scale demo with power production, then what you do is bring, of course this is all just notional right now, you in effect bring another set of, of uh, manufacturing equipment up and specialized canisters that start making about 90% of your production material uh, equipment out of the material from the moon. So that's the black thing. Now, every kilogram of stuff that you bring up from the Earth production machinery turns into 10 kilograms of production machinery. So you can now double your production rate. You bring in another one, doubles, and what I'm trying to get at is that this can grow exponentially. There's nothing magic about this. This is the same thing that happened as the English settled on the east coast of the U.S. and then started bringing in not just machinery from England, but the ideas for building machinery. Here, though, we know an enormous amount about the moon and its common materials, and there's absolutely no reason you can't get down into detailed design of this whole system architecture. So what it will do is let you get into exponential growth of power plots and total energy output to Earth, that's this graph. That then decreases the front end cost because it increases the leverage of your Earth to Moon transport and implies much larger facilities in orbit around the Earth and orbit around the Moon and on the Moon. So the next thing I'm going to talk to you about are estimates that we've done. I, uh, this is an idea that was originated by myself and Dr. Robert Waldron, who's now retired from, uh, from aerospace. And uh, we thought of it well over 20 years ago, during the time that the solar power satellite studies were coming to an end, and about the time that 
the study, I had the only study in the 70s sponsored by NASA of how you take a lunar dirt and change it into engineering material. At that point, we realized there's no need to build satellites. We've got one. It's very useful. And so it's important to uh, realize that, well, here, here's the overall system that provides load following power to Earth. Uh, you send directly to the Earth when you can see a rectangle. Uh, from the moon. When you can't, you go through a relay satellite, and I'll mention some variations of that in a minute. But these can be very, very high efficiency devices, operate at high power density. And that way, over the course of the uh, of the Earth day, uh, you can uh, these things will these beams will be continuously established and phased out to follow the power needs at any point on Earth. So from the moon, the entire Earth looks like a load which is pretty smooth compared to say what happens in Los Angeles or here in San Francisco where you have a lot of power during the day and not much late at night. But what I'm going to tell you about is based on over a billion dollars of studies of what is on the moon. Most people don't realize it, but there's been an ongoing program since 1969 of studying the moon, both the moon materials and, and remote sensing. There's been well over $50 million of space solar power studies Two million on how to use lunar materials to build solar power stations. And then we've got the quick evolution in our terrestrial economy, materials and manufacturing technologies. Uh, right now, you can go to Fry's Electronics and get a microwave oven in which the microwave generator costs less than a cent a watt, which is trivial cost. And so we've been able to go in and use models, especially out of here and reasonable assumptions for the systems technologies and reasonable transportation costs, 500 to $1,000 a uh, kilogram into orbit, but that's not critical. And project how much a system like this would cost. Now this is all published. I'll leave some, I've brought about 30 or 40 papers of various kinds that I can leave here and you're welcome to have them. Uh, this is a life cycle model. We start now, and by 2050, we've got our uh, 20 terawatts of installed electric power. And then we we'll supply that steadily for another 20 years, and that gives us a total of 1,000 terawatt electric years by 2070. If you operated this at constant level for a century, you'd get that 2,000 terawatt electric years. Assume 90% bootstrapping, and we'll have about 10 to the fifth square kilometers of reflective antennas or rectennas on Earth. Uh, this would be about 170th of the area that you require if you're trying to do it with photovoltaics on Earth to get the 20 terawatts in. Photovoltaics would not be dependable. You can actually go in and calculate how much mass you need in the various kinds of equipment. It's dominated by micro manufacturing uh, and by uh, the habitats and shops for the, for the mobile units and your manufacturing units. But you can go in figure out how much you need for glass forming, for pulling the iron and, and small grain sections out of the soil, the common soils, chemical refining, gathering and ejecting material to earth, uh, to orbit around the moon, excavation and all. It comes out to about 63,000 tons, of which about 70% will be installed over the first 30 years. And you'll be growing about 12 to years in, about 10 years into this, you would start to be delivering electric power to Earth within 12 to 15 years. You'd have enough power coming back to Earth, enough energy, that you'd actually pay back your initial cost. The cost of the rectennas on Earth, this is, does not include financing, would be about uh, $0.8 trillion. These are reflective antennas, or uh, rectennas, much cheaper than what NASA originally talked about. And your total non-finance cost in today's dollars of the lunar activities would be about 0.8 trillion also. The engineering cost of this power would be about 0.1 cent a kilowatt electric hour. So that meets the bogey of providing, being able to provide cheap power to the rest of the world. And it requires on the order of uh, 40 times more people, well, I'm sorry, uh, six times more people than were originally proposed for a space station when it was going to be fully operational, about that same number in orbit around the moon, and about 400 500 on the moon. 
So these are extrapolations of what we could do if, if we just make a clear commitment to finishing what we started. Now, this revenue, this would generate over the 70 years about $80 trillion in revenue, uh, so almost 101 for a new investment, at least for the space park. And at a cent a kilowatt electric power, it does not include a clean energy premium or the fact that these rec tenants can be put over agricultural industrial land and, and be essentially a supplement to the income that land would otherwise uh, produce. But what's most important, this energy that's coming down will enable secure investments in developing nations because they'll finally have the power to do something. So think of it like the Tennessee Valley Authority back in the 30s and 40s where you took a dirt poor area of the U.S. and 40 years later it was a very rich area because of the development that you had enabled. <coughs> Now these are gigawatt years, so to divide these by 1,000, this is ter terawatt years of thermal energy versus time over this coming century. And right now, we're using fossil fuel up and we're depleting it. A rich world would really deplete our fossil fuels this century. Lunar power could come like this, provide net new energy to Earth. And toward the end of this century, we would actually have net new energy coming into Earth that would let us have net new economic growth with no fossil fuel downside to it. So what are the advantages? Well, I think we can I project that you can get energy costs down by factor 10 to 100. Uh, if you're just down by factor 10, that's equivalent to $2 a barrel of oil. You're burning oil to make the electricity. Significant growth potential at very low marginal cost. It's like building a factory. Once the factory is built, you just keep or expand it. You can just expand and keep output growing at a very low additional cost. Few of them are any environmental cost. It's reliable. Uh, the energy payback for the investments on the moon and on the, on the Earth are about a month each. And it introduces a new source of useful work, which can grow the economy by about a factor of five by 2050. So you can get the world average income above or close to the present U.S. average income, close to 30,000 a year within 50 years. Fast growth through exponential growth. And the beam power itself can be used to reduce the space and lunar operations cost. Enormous environmental advantages. You produce no, produce only negligible waste. There's no greenhouse gases, no waste, no dust, no radionuclides, no hazardous facilities. These rectennas on Earth are just silicon and aluminum and glass. You can take them apart. You don't have anything like nuclear plants or dams or mines. Just pure electricity comes out. Uh, it, you can totally balance. The input power comes in at 20% of sunlight, only 15 to 10% of it's waste heat at the rectenna. You can reflect out sunlight by painting the rectenna white or putting white gravel in here. So the whole thing can be energy balanced. It's absolutely independent of the biosphere, and we consume so much of the biosphere you now we absolutely need that. So we can then become remediators of past damage. We can have completely clean recycling of goods. We can have production of hydrogen, we can have production of uh, recyclable synthetic petroleum. In principle, if you burn petroleum and release it to the atmosphere, you can draw that CO2 out of the atmosphere, the ocean, or the biomass, and make the whole thing flow cycle. Provides a lot of incentives for Americans. We're the only nation in the world that could do this right now. We can do it. We would then have a secure supply of primary energy that would be rapidly growing and would enable sustainable wealth. We draw Americans back into science and engineering. We could have a global energy revenue and a positive balance of payments. We could do this for a fraction of our balance of pay, our negative balance of payments. It would let us have investment plans and Marshall investment plans for developing nations. We could be the first greenhouse neutral nation. It would enable us to have growing wealth and population beyond Earth, which I think everybody in this room wants. 
We have secure and huge offers of data, information, communication, and observation systems. And these beams, especially beams that are, that are very short wavelengths, say a millimeter or a tenth millimeter off the moon, can be directed out past the orbit of Pluto. And so you can warm, just like sun does, but many further times out, you can warm comets and asteroids and get them to ablate material and change their trajectory. This is radar, you can find out what's going to hurt you, you can gently eliminate it, you can keep it from coming and hitting you. And this is not death ray beams, it's just very gentle heating. Also enable uh, space rectennas to receive power at much higher than the intensity of sunlight and power ion drives so you can have electric train-like operations throughout the entire solar system at very low cost. There are big incentives for flexible energy businesses to get into this. Right now, the world spends $130 billion a year trying to keep up the production just of oil and natural gas. Uh, about three years of this, you would be investments, you'd be in break even for the lunar power, and the power would just be increasing. The largest energy company only handles about 4 million barrels of oil a day. But this, for global prosperity, would be the equivalent of 900 a day, so it's a great growth opportunity. And these reserves are declining. The moon provides us a way to get away from dependence on national oil companies, uh, increasing legal, environmental, and physical, opposition and physical damage to workers. For instance, last year, 6,000 people in China lost their lives in the COVID. About 60 million premature deaths a year occur worldwide because we don't have uh, adequate cheap uh, commercial power. Uh, it'd be nice to have 10 billion customers that could afford your product. I've mentioned this, so I'll just go over it, but our transportation companies all face the problem of polluting energy sources. This is probably the only source of hydrogen that uh, you could afford to make the hydrogen. Uh, I've mentioned that before. Uh, manufacturers that make cars, for, uh, their suppliers could profit from this by becoming involved in the design of the production machinery on the moon and manufacturing systems. It might open markets as large as a trillion dollars, almost immediately. Finance, the world runs on finance. This is a, a rectenna that would be scaled to receive about 10 10 gigawatts, enough for a fairly large metropolis area. Uh, right now, electricity is associated with ten dollars of new, uh, ten trillion dollars of new wealth for every terawatt year of electric power. With increasing energy, with increasing efficiency, that might have to go up to fifteen trillion dollars. So by 2050, for 20 terawatts, you could be looking at a world gross product increasing from about 40 trillion a year to 300 trillion. A year. And that's where this $30,000 a person comes from. And this is physically stable. But these rectennas can provide multiple use of real estate on the order of 10 to the fifth square right kilometer of real estate. There would be a vast increase in, in uh, wealth and consumer finance. And this could accelerate the transition to an electric economy, which is actually projected to occur by 2050 anyway. And imply on the order of $3 trillion a year of economic activity on the moon by 2050, so about 30% of the present U.S. growth output. Here's Jupiter, back about the time the solar power satellite studies were coming to a head, 1977, the Voyager 1 spacecraft was launched. Uh, two years later, it and its other companion, Voyager 2, took these beautiful close-up pictures of Jupiter as they flew by. Earth is about this size on the scale of Jupiter. In 1977, I'm sorry, in 1997, 20 years later, Voyager 1 had flipped past the outer planets, was flipped up north of the ecliptic plane, and in uh, 
19, in September the 13th, 1996, it was 66 AU from Earth, 66 times the distance of the Earth from the Sun. And it was commanded to, with that same camera that took the pictures of Jupiter, take the picture of the inner solar system. And of course, here is our ultimate source of power and energy, existence, the Sun. And these are inserts taken at much longer time exposures where the streaks are just aliasing in the photographs. But this is the area around Venus, this is the area around the Earth. So, you know, you have your hopes and dreams, you live in California, you have a great life, and all of it. All politics is local, this is the Earth. And we stand in a very serious situation. We're on the verge, for, for the last hundred years, most people on Earth, have been living in extreme resource depletion. Coming back in, back to 1969, we've got this marvelous companion to our pale blue dot, which for reasons that I think I don't really understand, we've never looked at using. And yet it's quite clear to me that if we want to survive as a human race, get prosperity, we've got to start using this resource. So, lunar solar power system and prosperity, the concept is very well defined. There are many, many versions that can be implemented, but it can be done uh, in parallel. The only thing the power system cares about is sunbeams coming up and merging in space in front of the moon, between the Earth and the moon. You can put many, many different kinds of engineering back on the moon to bring that about. You don't have to even lock yourself into one particular thing. It's the only known option, at least as far as I can tell, for global prosperity. It can be started immediately. We could uh, have the demo power plots operating on Earth in two years. We could have uh, unmanned craft <coughs> on the moon putting sub-models of these plots on the moon in five years. We could have production facilities on the moon in eight to ten years. We could be ramping this thing up so that all the electric power on Earth um, in, uh, in the U.S. was provided inside of 12 to 15 years. If we had stayed on the moon, rather than going to Vietnam, or if we just stayed on the moon, we could have started this in 1980. And all new power in the U.S. could not come from the moon. We would not have a negative balance of payments due to oil imports. So, Next business actions, first, realize it is a business and start funding it in joint government, industry, cooperative effort. That will enable prudent investments worldwide, enormous national benefits. Uh, the U.S. ought to help us with the demonstrations. They are our government sometimes. And uh, start implementing the same money. And I ran over three minutes, I'm sorry.
all work at that instant. Couldn't we just stand back and figure out a way to use that a little bit more intelligently? And uh, what I've learned over the past 30 frustrating years is it's awfully hard to get a big organization to go back and do something really useful with what it knows it's done. And you guys have helped make that challenge. We've got this enormous wealth staring us right in the face, and it's just bad habits keeping us here. Thank you. Thank you.